Hey guys, welcome to part 1 of what if Naruto and Tamari became missing nin, if you enjoyed the video then like, share and subscribe and also comment your thoughts as it inspires me to make more such videos and remember to check out my playlist section for other interesting stories. So let's get started. Chapter 1. Prologue, Failure. The night was cold, and the wind blew steadily over the treetops. On the wall stood a solitary figure, gazing off into the darkness of the forest, his mind haunted by memories. He had failed. Failed to save his friend and failed to keep his promise to Sakura. What was his way of the ninja, worth if he couldn't even save those few who he cared about? How many days had it been? He wasn't sure. He spent his days in fitful slumber haunted by nightmares, and his nights were spent exactly as he was now, gazing out into the forest, seeking answers. He let himself drift, reflecting on all that had happened since he passed the Genin exam, trying to find some fault in his actions, somewhere he had gone wrong. There must have been a way to save Sasuke, he refused to allow himself to think otherwise. He thought about Kakashi and Uruka, those who had tried to teach him everything there was to know about being a ninja. He thought about Sakura, who he now realized would never have eyes for anyone other than the bastard, and of the various other people whom he has had that sometimes pleasure of knowing. Kanahamaru, Lee, Neji Sandime, Sanade, Dreya, Shikamaru, Chuji, Hinata, and Kiba. He immersed himself in memories. Naruto blinked and looked up at the sky, feeling a drop of water on his face. Within minutes, a light rain was covering Kanoha. He laughed bitterly to himself as more painful memories surfaced. Memories of time spent in idle banter with Haku in the forest, of the inevitable fight, they fought simply because they were on different sides, and some of the last words, the boys had uttered. Please hurry and kill me, I'm sorry that you had to stain your hands. Dot please fulfill your dreams. My dreams. Dot my dream to become Hokage, to gain everyone's respect, and to never take back my words. Dot my dreams are a joke. Naruto broke. He fell to his knees, and let his tears mingle with the rain. I've been wasting my time, what would Zaboza and Haku think of me now? I once thought they were evil, but they both died in contentment, fighting for those they loved most. Of all things he believed that to be true, and sometimes, it was all that kept him going. When he seemed doomed, he tried to remember the look Zaboza had had on his face, tears running down it, as he had fought to avenge Haku with nothing, but a kunai in his mouth. There had been fury, despair, and love. Zaboza, killer of 100, demon of the hidden mist, had loved Haku like a son and in return had gotten love and loyalty above any other. Naruto looked up into the sky and wondered if he would ever be able to understand those feelings, and suddenly felt a need to escape. He jumped off the wall onto the slightly damp forest floor and dashed off into the darkness. In years to come he would look upon this as one of the most irrational decisions he had ever made, but it was always followed up with a laugh and the comment that it was also one of the best. Chapter 2 A Short Vacation Originally, Naruto had no idea where he was going, he just felt the need to run. He pushed himself to the limit, trying to escape the past by exhausting his body. He ran for what felt like hours, the rain splattering on his face as he was assaulted by memories. He continued to run long into the night, and he collapsed under a tree, just as dawn was breaking and immediately fell into a blissfully dreamless sleep. Naruto woke groggily to the sound of birds chirping. He sat up against the tree and, shading his face with one hand, glanced at the sun. It seemed to be late afternoon as the sun was high, and the puddles of water from the previous night's rain were already starting to dry up. He stood up and stretched, letting out a long yawn, and took note of his surroundings. All the peace his previous night's exertions had given him vanished as soon as he realized where he was. This was where he had had his first experience fighting enemy Shinobi. He and his team had fought the demon brothers here, and he had, under this very same tree, sworn an oath on pain as he jabbed a kunai into his hand to bleed out poison. He couldn't help but laugh at the irony, he had run right into the hands of the same experiences he had been trying to escape. He wondered idly if anyone in Kanoha was worried about him, but brushed it off immediately, no one in Kanoha would notice even if he disappeared from right under their noses. 
He froze at this thought and glanced at the path that led to wave country. He turned around in a circle, looking at all the scenery around him, and for the first time in weeks, he had a true smile on his face. Why not? He called out to the empty forest, I could use a vacation, and it's been far too long since I did anything for myself, and it will be nice to see how that Brad and Nari has grown. Having thoroughly convinced himself, and with nothing but the cloths on his back and 13 shuriken, Naruto eagerly dashed down the long road to wave country. Despite his initial enthusiasm, hours of walking had dampened Naruto's spirits. There are very few things, he decided, more boring than traveling long distances by yourself. He was soon playing games with himself, seeing how far he could jump from one tree to another, or pretending to be stalking an imaginary enemy, but these were only temporary distractions, so pretty soon he decided to just run again. It took only four days to reach the borders of Wave Country, and it was with great relief that a chakra depleted Naruto flopped up against the side of the bridge that had altered his life forever, and just watched the people go by, waiting to regain some of his stamina. Naruto wandered around the relatively small city that was the capital of Wave Country in awe. It was completely different from how it had been, but a short time ago. Shopkeepers called out into the packed markets, and fresh fruit and vegetables from all corners of the globe filled produce carts. The city appeared to now be a central hub of trade. Naruto's explorations eventually led him to the center of town, where he was more than shocked to see a large stone monument in the middle of a small park. It had a simple pyramid shape and was about six feet high, and each side was inscribed with the symbol of the hidden leaf. After a short prayer at the monument, Naruto realized he had to stop stalling. He was tired, had no food or clothing, and was broke. He knew logically there was no reason to be afraid of Tazuna and his family. They were his friends, but he hadn't exactly given them any warning, so he was understandably nervous. He eventually did manage to work up his nerve and make his way to Tazuna's house, only to find that it was no longer there. With a sigh, Naruto went to a neighbor and knocked on the door. Yeah, what do want? Came the rather annoyed sounding voice from inside the house. Um. I was wondering if you knew where Tazuna the bridge builder is living? Tazuna. The door opened slightly and a middle-aged man, peeked out he moved out a month ago, got into the trade business and got himself and his daughter a better house near the market who wants to know. Naruto improvised, using mostly the truth. I'm an old friend of Inari, the grandson, and figured I'd visit as I passed through the country. The man shrugged his shoulders and gave Naruto the address. Naruto got somewhat upset when he arrived at said address to find he had passed the very house earlier that day, but he was sufficiently impressed, it looked as though the old man had done well for himself after the bridge was finished. The house was no mansion but it was three stories and looked brand new. Now very tired of traveling, he trudged up to the door and gave three sharp knocks. Not a moment later, a voice, which Naruto recognized as belonging to Tsunami, called out from inside the house. Be there in a minute. Dot Inari. Stop throwing those knives. Naruto sweat dripped as the sounds of a struggle were heard from within the house. A moment later, a somewhat stressed-looking Tsunami opened the door. I'm very sorry, sir. My son likes to play ninja with kitchen knives and... Dot Naruto. Naruto sweat dripped again as Tsunami spun around and yelled back into the house. Dad. Inari. It's Naruto at the front door. The sound of pounding feet could be heard and Tsunami stepped out of the way as Naruto found himself flying backwards, the victim of a tackle hug and landed rather firmly on his behind only to see a somewhat larger than he remembered Inari grinning at him from his seat on Naruto's stomach. Twenty minutes and two tackling houseguest, lectures later, they were all sitting down to a late night snack of instant ramen in the dining room. So, Naruto, what brings you all the way out here? Tazuna inquired not that I'm not happy to see you, but I would expect that you'd be with your team. Naruto didn't have the heart to tell them that Sasuke had betrayed the leaf, so he again used his improvisation skills. I just had some personal vacation time, and decided I'd come see how you were all doing, he accented this with his trademark fox grin. Inari grinned back, and Tsunami looked like she believed him, but Tazuna raised his eyebrow slightly. Well, Tazuna said, you're welcome to stay here, as long as you like. 
As you can see, he gestured around, my trade business is booming, so don't hesitate to ask if you need anything. Thanks for the offer, Tazuna-san, Naruto replied, but right now, I want nothing more than a soft bed. Tsunami, if you would be, so kind as to show our guest to his soft bed, Tazuna laughed, we'll let him get some sleep. Tsunami led Naruto up to what appeared to be a guest room on the third floor, and he was more than happy to discover that the bed was much softer than the second-hand junk he had at home. His last thought before he drifted off was, maybe I should consider staying here for a while. Chapter 3, Kubaikiri Husha, Ryo, and the Barber Naruto woke up before sunrise the next morning and sat up against the wall. It had been almost six days since anyone had seen him in Kanoha. Another ten days before that he had returned from his failed mission. Sixteen days. He could still feel the sting where Sakura had slapped him. Could he really blame her? He had made a promise he couldn't keep, and it wasn't like she owed him anything. It's not like had helped her before. After all, wasn't it Sasuke who had defeated Haku to protect his friend, Sasuke who had protected them in the forest of death, Sasuke who saved her ungrateful ass from Gara. Naruto blinked at where his previous train of thought had taken him. It was rare for him to be this bitter, he had years of practice with being abused. The more he thought about it, the more he realized that no one would cry for him if he never went back. Sure, Sinead would be sad, but her duties would quickly consume her life and he would be forgotten. Drea had left Kanoha again, so it might take him years to even find out that Naruto had left. Damn. Now he was just being depressing. Naruto jumped out of bed, looked around the room to see his cloths laying, clean and folded, on a table near the door. He silently blessed Tsunami as he rushed to get dressed. Tazuna was peaceful. He was the only one ever up this early, so he spent his time drinking green tea in meditative relection. He was calm, one with himself and his surroundings. Then came Naruto. Like an orange bullet, Naruto bounced into the kitchen. Good morning. Tazuna san he called, causing Tazuna to spit out his mouthful of green tea and glare, balefully at the boy, who had the nerve to be this energized this early in the morning. Good morning Naruto, would you care for some tea? Tazuna asked, but Naruto waved him off. So old man, where do you keep your instant ramen? Tazuna blinked. Ramen. Dot there isn't any here. I don't like the instant stuff and my daughter won't let Inari touch the stuff, she says it causes insanity. Naruto laughed, insanity. I eat ramen two to three meals a day, and look at me. Actually, Tazuna replied, I think you're where she got the idea in the first place. Tazuna smirked to himself as he watched Naruto grumble. But, he continued, I hear there's a great 24-hour ramen stand on the corner of 18th and Swordfish. Naruto blushed, well see, I didn't actually bring any money with me, so. Tazuna looked at him for a second, and tossed him some money. 1000 yen, knock yourself out kid. Naruto grinned and dashed out the door, calling back over his shoulder. Thanks old maniev sama thanks to doth as morning not sirunil back. The door slammed. Tazuna went back to his tea. Naruto sprinted through town and found the ramen stand, exactly where the old man said it would be. He hopped onto a stool and ordered three bowls of beef ramen, he didn't have time for a full meal, and while waiting pondered the mystery of why all ramen stands were owned by kind old men with cute daughters to take orders. His musings were short-lived as said cute daughter quickly brought out his ramen. He wasted no time, and a small crowd of people on their way to work had gathered to watch him eat by the time he was finished. Ignoring his fans, he leapt over the crowd and again started to run, he figured he only had about 12 minutes before the sun rose. He arrived at his destination just as the first rays of sun were peeking over the horizon. Everything here was almost exactly as he remembered it, as if this place had been untouched by time. It was really nothing more than a small clearing in the woods, but it was one of Naruto's most important places. It seemed like yesterday, he had carried Haku's body here all the way from the bridge, and he was soaked with blood and tears. Sakura had been fawning over Sasuke's injuries, so he and Kakashi had dug two graves, carefully placed the bodies in the holes, filled them in, and placed two crosses made of bound wood to mark the spot. 
Naruto had then, with all his strength, taken Zabuza's great sword and slammed it into the dirt. It had also been here, two weeks later that he had sworn to never ignore his heart in favor of what his village told him to do. Those had been some of the most naive words of his life. Kakashi had smiled at him as he said that everyone Kakashi loved had died for putting the mission first, but Kakashi had had reason to believe in his village, it was a place of belonging for him and it was all he had left. As long as a shinobi had a village, the village had to come first. Considering how Kanoha treated him, Naruto wasn't sure he could live with that. As he approached the graves he had his breath taken away. His musings had slowed him down, and dawn was well underway. There was Zabuza's sword, right where he had put it, but the sun's light had ignited the sky and clouds, making the sword look as if surrounded by a halo of fire. Some imperceptible force drew him to it, and as the light reflected, read off the exposed part of the blade, he unconsciously reached and grabbed the handle. This, for him, was the embodiment of Zabuza's spirit, everything the demon of the mist had done or felt, had done with this very blade at his side. Part of Naruto screamed at him, to let go, turn around and run back to Kanoha, but his decision had been made long ago, he just had never realized it until that moment. Nukunen, Ozumaki Naruto, he said, as if introducing himself to the sword, and with one sharp pull, he drew it from the ground. He held it up with his right hand, and though significantly taller than Naruto himself was, the sword was surprisingly light. He rested the back of the blade on his other hand and examined it. He had never really taken a close look at the sword before, as he had usually been trying to dodge it. The blade was mostly straight with a short curve at the end, the handle was about half as long as the blade, and was wrapped in some rough material, as well as having ridges every six inches or so. Both, Naruto imagined, were there to help grip it. In total, he estimated the sword's length at about seven one-half feet. As he looked closer, he saw an inscription. Engraved in the blade, right above the handle was written, Kubaikiri Husha. Naruto snickered, it would be like Zabuza to name his sword. But then again, he supposed, it was also like himself. His examination had only taken a couple of minutes, but the sun was now above the horizon and Naruto quickly decided that he would need some way to hide the sword before the majority of the populace started to go about their business. He glanced around the clearing again, and with a short prayer and a promise to return, he was rushing back to the edge of town with Kubai Kiri over his shoulder. He arrived at the edge of town to see, just as he had feared, people getting up and starting to fill the streets. The first thing he saw was a clothing store, so he rushed inside, being careful not to cut the top of the doorframe, and glanced around the store. A young woman who had been working at a sewing machine was now staring rather pointedly at his sword. Hey lady, I have Naruto reached into his pocket and grabbed his change from breakfast 508 yen, and I need a 7 foot by 4 foot piece of fabric. What can you give me? The young woman quickly composed herself and thought for a moment, do you care about quality? I could give you a piece from the end of a roll, but ends are always frayed on one edge. I don't care about quality or color, but I would like it soon, Naruto said nervously. He was hoping that no one had recognized the sword and each second increased the risk. The woman disappeared into a back room and appeared moments later with the requested cloth. It was thick, white, and almost exactly the size he needed. Naruto grabbed the cloth, shoved the money into her hand, spread the cloth over the table, set Kubai Kiri on it and stared. It hadn't really occurred to him that he had no idea how to wrap it. The woman, who Naruto now took the time to notice, had a name tag that read Ryo, laughed slightly at the flabbergasted look on his face. Would you like some help with that? She asked, still giggling. Naruto had the grace to blush, uh. Yeah, I've never wrapped anything before, and it really wouldn't be good if the cloth fell off in the middle of the city, he said a bit uneasily. Rio laughed again and went to the other side of the table. Within a few minutes, she had taught him how to wrap the sword, tucking in the cloth at the ends, so it wouldn't come loose. During all this time, Naruto was just marveling that he had just walked into a random store with a seven-foot blade and was being treated with nothing but kindness. He smiled at her and grabbed his newly wrapped sword. Thanks, Rio san He called back as he left the shop. 
Back in the shop, Rio sighed. She had just sold 2,500 yen worth of high-quality cloth for 508 yen because the boy had been cute. The owner was going to be pissed. Naruto was happily walking down the street with his new cloth-wrapped bundle. He was getting some weird looks, but he had decided that looking weird was much better than looking dangerous. With his minor panic attack over, it was just starting to sink in that he was now a self-declared missing nin. Though the decision to leave the village left him much more relaxed, he realized that he had a lot to do. He started to make a mental checklist. First of all, he had to change his appearance. Naruto was not so arrogant as to think he could take on the Kanoha Hunter Nin, so that meant that he had to hide from them, no one could ever recognize him. He also realized with some sadness that he'd have to change his last name. Secondly, he had to learn to use his new sword. This mostly would consist of simple taijutsu training but Naruto also wanted to learn some of the ninjutsu that Zabuza had used so effectively, most specifically, Kirigakur no Jutsu. Thirdly, he had decided that Zabuza and Haku needed true gravestones, not just the wood crosses he had make with nails. This would require him to earn some money, which he obviously needed to do anyway, but it also meant staying in wave country, maybe for as long as two months, and that would be cutting it tight. Fourthly and finally, he had to send some kind of message back to Kanoha, he wanted to give the impression he was dead, so a suicide note would be appropriate. No one who cared about him would have problems understanding why he would kill himself and everyone else would celebrate, so that would work out well. The only problem would be that the note would have to come from somewhere far from wave country. He would have to think about that. Naruto continued down the street and noticed a couple of sailors staring at his forehead, cursing himself, he realized he had his forehead protector on. He rushed into a side street and shoved it into his pocket before hurrying back to Tazuna's house, annoyed at his own stupidity, but happy that he had at least some vague plans. He opened the door and walked into the now eerily silent house. He knew that Inari had school and Tazuna had to run his business but it didn't make their absence any more disconcerting. His unease was alleviated slightly when he heard the sound of water running and humming in the kitchen. He peeked his head in to see Tsunami washing the breakfast dishes. He ran upstairs to his room and climbed out the window onto the roof. He found a secluded spot facing away from the road and hid Kubaikiri. He then snuck back inside and crept into the kitchen behind Tsunami. He cleared his throat and she jumped, spinning around only to smile upon seeing who it was. You've got to learn to make sound when you move, Naruto, she said shakily. You scared me half to death. As she was collecting herself, Naruto took a moment to think. He didn't want to lie to Tazuna's family, but he also didn't want to leave a trail. He decided not to tell too much of the truth, he was afraid of Hunter Nin more than he was afraid of Tazuna's discovering his lie. Ni, Tsunami-san, he tried to look embarrassed, I kinda lost my pack on the way here, I really don't mean to impose but. Stop, Tsunami cut him off and smiled at him, father makes enough money that he could buy a new house every week, your shopping expenses wouldn't even make a mark on the books. Thanks Tsunami-san, and by the way, I noticed the monument in that park near the market, do you know who made it? Naruto was hoping she did, he had noticed the stonework was superb, probably someone he could hire to carve the two gravestones he needed. Tsunami thought for a moment, I think it was Soba Akira, he runs a stone and metal workshop near the north end of the city, why? Naruto needed an excuse, and suddenly got a great idea, I was thinking I might stay in the city for a while, and figured I'd need to get a job. I thought that any guy who made such an amazing monument to Kanoha would be the kind of guy I'd want to work for. Once again, Naruto had to internally laugh at the irony of his words, but he had gotten what he wanted. So, Naruto started again, would you be willing to come cloth shopping with me or am I on my own in this? Tsunami glanced around at the house, looking a bit harried. Would it be okay if you shopped on your own, Naruto-kun, I really have a lot of work to do today, she continued apologetically as she reached into her purse, will 40,000 yen be enough? Naruto was ecstatic, but tried not to show it, that much money would normally sustain him for two weeks, he was determined to save a large portion of it. He realized she had been holding the money out for half a minute and took it. 
trying to respond. 40,000 yen. That will be more than enough, but I'm not sure how long it will take and really don't know where to go, my cloths have always been pre-ordered and paid for by the Hokage. Tsunami looked as though she were shocked at the thought of someone having never gone cloth shopping. She grabbed a pad of paper and wrote down an address, here, Naruto-kun, start at this shop, the lady who runs it is a friend of mine, if you don't find anything you like there, she'll help direct you. Naruto thanked her profusely for both the money and the advice and soon found himself back out in the bustling streets. He followed the directions on the paper, but started to get suspicious as the streets started to look familiar, he arrived at the address Tsunami had given him only to start banging his head against the nearest lamppost. Ryo sat in her chair staring at the ceiling, apart from the cute boy with the sword this morning, the day had been really dull. She had finished three minor alterations and helped an old lady pick out some socks and was now attempting to count the bumps on the stucco ceiling. All of this essentially meant that she was more than happy for the distraction when she saw cute sword boy smashing his head against a lamppost outside the shop. She walked to the door and called out, Hey, can I help you with anything? Naruto glanced around and realizing he had once again drawn attention to himself, rushed inside the shop. Yeah. See. I'm looking for some cloths. Ryo blinked, this is a clothing store, care to be more specific. Once again Naruto found himself embarrassed, um, I really can't be more specific, I've never really shopped for cloths before. Now she was interested, never shopped before. Ryo didn't actually find that hard to believe as she looked at his orange jumpsuit. Did you at least have something in mind? Naruto having never had any choice as to what he wore found that if he thought about it and looked around the store, he did have some ideas. He wandered over to the pants and started to pull things off the rack. Ni, Ryo-san, he said as he browsed, do you know of any good barbers nearby, particularly any who specialize dyeing hair? If Ryo was confused by the question, she didn't show it. There's an old man who uses some weird technique to make his own dyes, he can supposedly make dyes that alter the roots themselves, but I don't really believe that. Forty minutes later, Naruto had picked out what he thought were enough cloths. He had two pair of black pants, a couple white t-shirts, a dark navy vest with all the needed pockets, and new sets of sock and underwear. He was well aware that this ensemble clashed horribly with his hair, but he intended for that to be the next thing he changed. He left the store after giving Ryo a 500 yen tip, happily holding the address of his next destination, and wearing his new cloths. He didn't wear a shirt and left the vest unzipped, letting it hang so his seal would show if he molded any chakra. Naruto had a bit more trouble finding the barber shop because the owner had never bothered to put up address numbers and the sign was pretty small. When he did find it, he walked in with every intention of giving the owner a piece of his mind. He took one step in and his mind ground to a halt, the old man was out of, within another room but Naruto sensed what was undeniably, chakra manipulation. Cursing whatever luck had caused him to run into Shinobi, he started the seals for Cage Bunshin while backing out of the store. He only managed two steps before he felt a kunai at his throat on the other end, of which was a rather pissed of looking old man who had just moved faster than Naruto could follow. After his initial moment of panic and realizing that he wasn't dead, he looked at the man. He wasn't wearing a forehead protector, that was good, he did appear to be a barber, and that combined with the fact that he was old made Naruto sure, this was the man he was looking for, the only problem was the knife still at his throat. So, I hear you specialize in hair dye? Naruto asked, causing the old man to raise an eyebrow. Yes, you heard correctly. Though if you're a customer, it's generally preferred if you don't perform jutsus in the shop, I like to keep it clean. The man replied perfectly calmly, as if he weren't threatening Naruto's life. So then, Naruto asked, how much do you charge for that special dye of yours? I'm looking for the permanent root-altering stuff. The man leaned over and studied Naruto's head. 7,000 yen, 4,000 if you have any good stories. Naruto was confused. Stories. What kind of stories? The old man's eyebrow rose higher. You are a missing nin, aren't you? I don't see a forehead protector. No village I've heard of has a uniform like that. You're too slow to be an undercover, anbu or hunter nin, and to top it off, 
You come here wanting permanent hair dye, so I think it's pretty obvious. When he put it like that, Naruto had to agree that it was pretty obvious. That didn't, however, help with the current situation, so he decided to gamble and tell the truth, he had aversions against lying to people who could have probably detect his lie and be kick his ass. Yeah, I'm a missing nin, though I really just decided that this morning. After a moment of thought, the old man removed the kunai and dropped it into one of the many pockets in his smock, did a 180 turn, and walked back into the back room. What color? The old man called. It took a second for Naruto to realize that the man was asking about hair dye. A dark maroon, he called back to the man. Naruto had thought carefully about his choice of color. He wanted something drastically different from his current blonde, but not something he wouldn't like. The man emerged holding a bottle and a bucket and gestured towards one of the barber chairs. Naruto sat as the man rubbed an odd chemical into his hair before telling him to rinse his hair in the bucket. Once that was done, the man took out a pair of scissors, started to trim and told Naruto to start a story. The next hour was one of the most bizarre and interesting of Naruto's life as he and the man exchanged stories of their lives as shinobi. Naruto talked about the mist techniques he wanted to learn and how he hoped to learn them and the old man told Naruto of missions he had done in years long past. No introductions were made, and no names were mentioned, neither even knew what village the other was from, but both felt as if they knew the other by the end of the cut and die. Naruto gave the man his money, a little salute, and walked out the door with his hair now a dark red. It would be hours later that he would find the small scroll in his pants pocket labeled beginning and intermediate stealth jutsus and with the mark of the hidden mist. Chapter 4, Inari, Kitchen Knife Ninja. The third morning, Naruto was awakened by the sound of mayhem on the lower floor. He had been up most of the night practicing Kirigakur no Jutsu. He had arrived at Tazuna's just in time for dinner, and had left right after, mainly because dinner had mostly consisted of the various family members ogling his new hair and cloths. He started practicing at the waterfront, and quickly got the Jutsu to work, it was an easy technique when compared to the cage, bunshin or racing gan, but controlling the mist effectively required a lot of chakra control. What this essentially meant was that he couldn't control the mist too well, but he got a lot of it. By the end of the night he had managed to perform the jutsu using only a bucket of water, but he had a feeling it would be a while before he could pull it off using just the water in the air. More important now however, was getting breakfast. Naruto slid on his pants and went downstairs, greeted by the sounds of Tsunami fighting her usual battle to get Inari ready for school on time. Watching her, Naruto figured she would have made a pretty good kunoichi. Inari. She hollered, how many times have I told you to stop throwing those knives? Naruto walked into the kitchen to find himself facing a number of steak knives embedded in the wall. He idly noted that considering Inari's position relative to that of the knives, the kid had pretty good aim. Naruto had the momentary image of a future battle, 1010, weapons master versus Inari, kitchen knife ninja. He laughed to himself, causing the room's other two occupants to finally notice him. Oh, good morning Naruto-kun Tsunami greeted while simultaneously trying to get Inari to stay still and eat his breakfast. This, of course, was quickly becoming impossible once Inari noticed his idol had entered the room, so Naruto decided he'd better calm things down. Ni, Inari, you really should eat your breakfast, if you don't, you'll be late for school, and if you're late for school you'll be in even more trouble, Naruto reasoned. Inari seemed to process this for a moment, but Naruto made sense, and his desire to please both his mother and idol overcame his defiance, so he grumblingly sat down and started to eat. Tsunami looked gratefully to Naruto before walking over and starting to yank knives out of the wall. Naruto-kun, she said as she pulled out another knife. There's some breakfast for you there too, I made pancakes. Naruto was in awe, he had never had pancakes made for him. He pretty much just eaten ramen in Kono. Crap. He had managed to avoid thinking about Konoha until now. He refused to feel guilty about leaving, feeling guilty led to thoughts about the people who would feel betrayed, and he refused to call what he had done betrayal. Betrayal implied that he owed something to Kanoha and the people who lived there. 
He continued down this thought path and Tsunami could only watch as Naruto looked more and more depressed. She then grabbed him firmly by the hand, jolting him out of his reverie, and dragged him over to the table. Sit, she commanded, so he sat next to Inari and waited only moments before a plate of pancakes were put in front of him. He grabbed his fork and decided to thoroughly enjoy this kind of food while he had it to eat, good food wouldn't be common in a life of traveling and hiding. Breakfast was soon finished and Inari left for school right after. Naruto then quickly helped Tsunami clean up the breakfast dishes and the retreated to his room. Now again left to his own devices, he snuck out onto the roof and grabbed Kubaikiri from where he hidden it the day before. Hefting the sword over his shoulder, he jumped down to the street and headed for the forest. Upon reaching a spot that he felt was sufficiently secluded, he unwrapped the sword with a flick of his wrist and started some basic swings, trying to get a feel for the balance of the blade. After just an hour, Naruto realized he had some serious muscle, building due to. He could lift the sword with one hand, but couldn't control it very well, his movements were choppy and predictable, particularly when he had to reverse direction. Another hour passed and Naruto discovered another problem. His small stature made it almost impossible to do any kind of upward cut. He would need to be at least a foot taller. He pondered over this conundrum for a few minutes and after some experimentation, found that he could jump while swinging to give him the extra height he needed. Naruto was, as always, obsessively persistent with his training and he was happy with his improvement by the time noon rolled around. He had decided that on the way back to Tazuna's for lunch, he would stop at Soba Akira's shop. It was on the way and Naruto wanted to meet the man as soon as possible. The shop was easy enough to find and appeared to be just a mid-sized building with a sign out front announcing the place as Soba's stone and metal workshop. Naruto jumped onto the roof and hit Kubaikiri. He didn't want to scare the man. He jumped back down and noticed that the front door was held open with a brick so he just walked in. Directly in front of him was a rather messy desk covered in papers and a bell with a label that said ring for service. Behind the desk the room opened up into a cement floored workshop covered in tools Naruto couldn't name, as well as pieces of stone and metal in various stages of carving. Naruto shrugged and rung the bell. A sharp ding. Reverberated through the building and Naruto heard some shuffling. A man in his late 20s or early 30s emerged from the back of the shop wearing a leather apron. He seemed a little rough around the edges, but his brown hair was neatly cut and he had an air of tidiness. Can I help you? He asked Naruto with a salesman's smile. Maybe, Naruto cautiously replied. I need a two gravestones for dome friends of mine, but don't have too much money, I was wondering if maybe I could help you out in the shop as payment. Soba looked skeptical, work here as payment. Do you have any experience with stone or metal working? Something like that, Naruto replied with a grin, take me to an block that you need a lot of stone removed from and I'll show you. Akira led him to a block of stone five feet high, with lines already drawn to show where stone had to be cut away. Naruto held out his hand and started to mold his chakra in the familiar swirling pattern. He opened the floodgates, pouring chakra into the now reasonably sized vortex in his hand. Racing Gan. He called as he slammed the orb into the stone block. It took a little less than 30 seconds to grind away most of the unneeded stone. He turned to Akira who was mumbling to himself with a dumb smile on his face, something about increasing production by 50. Akira soon snapped out of it and grabbed hold of Naruto's arm. I'll pay you 2,000 yen an hour, when can you start? He asked excitedly. Right now, Naruto replied with his trademark fox grin. He would later realize that with his new look, said grin made him look frightening rather than cute, but Akira appeared mostly unfaced. Naruto was expecting requests to use the racing gan again. What he got instead was a two one half hour lesson about every tool a carver could ever need and the various ways to use them. Though Naruto was impatient, his respect for the man went up a few notches. He was containing his excitement and making sure Naruto knew what he was doing before he unleashed him on the shop. Akira himself mentioned an experience he had had proving just how dangerous sandpaper could be. 
By the time Naruto's comprehensive tour of the shop was finished, then sun had set and Naruto realized that he had missed lunch again. It was starting to become a habit with him. It was like fate every time lunch came around something important would come up that would end up taking forever, and here he was, starving by the end of the day. He looked at Akira only to realize that the man had been talking to him, while he was pondering his hunger. Having no idea what had been said, Naruto just nodded vigorously, which seemed to be the correct response. So, you'll start work when tomorrow? Akira asked. Naruto thought for a minute, I'll be here at noon, I'm busy in the morning, so I'll work from 1 o'clock to 6 o'clock. Sound good? Akira nodded, yes, that should work nicely. We'll also need to discuss the details of your order. Naruto nodded as he turned to leave, okay then Akira-san, 1 o'clock it is. Akira grinned as the boy ran off into the distance, that kid's weird energy, ball thing would cut his production time in half. He was already drooling. Naruto waited until Akira had turned and gone into the shop before doubling back to pick up Kubai Kiri, it wouldn't be good to forget it. Naruto ran all the way home as he was now temporarily calling Tazuna's house. The day had gone as well as he could have hoped and better. He now had a job that was both training and paid better than being a ninja ever had. He could even move his plans forward, maybe as much as three weeks. Between the 18,000 yen he had left over from shopping, and a month's salary at 10,000 yen a day, he would be set for quite some time. Naruto jumped up to the roof, hit Kubai Kiri, slipped down to his window, and climbed inside. He figured he had 40 minutes before supper and there was something he needed to do. He sat on his bed and took his forehead protector out of his pocket. For the second time that day, he gathered a chakra swirl in his right hand, and then carefully used his racing gan to grind off the symbol of the hidden leaf. He grabbed a kunai out of his holster and even more carefully, carved in two kanji. He tied it back around his head, and went into the bathroom to admire his work. His forehead protector now read Akuma Shinkiru Demonic Mirage. Naruto had thought a lot about what he was going to do about his forehead protector. Leaving it in its original state would attract attention he didn't want from the leaf, but it was what told the world he was a shinobi, and he had no intention of settling somewhere and finding some menial job. He had finally decided that he would try to build a reputation on his own merits as a shinobi without loyalty to a village, but doing that would require a distinctive look, and he would have to eliminate everything inside him that could be recognized as Izumaki Naruto. It was in that moment, as he examined and pondered his almost unrecognizable appearance in the mirror, that Izumaki Naruto died, and Fushikao Naruto was born. It wasn't simply a decision to change a name, because Fushikao had to be everything Izumaki wasn't. Normal people would consider this as pretending to be someone you're not, but for Naruto, it was quite the opposite. He would have to learn to not to force himself to act a certain way, and he knew it would take a while. He started to practice his facial expressions in the mirror. The first thing he tried was smiling, which he soon found he had to be careful of. A full-blown smile showed off his longer and sharper than normal canines, and although they were great for intimidation, not so good for casual conversation. He tried a scowl or two, and everything seemed okay there though it was uncomfortable to scowl for more than a few seconds. Naruto continued on like this until supper time, practicing various expressions. This wouldn't have been a problem if Inari hadn't opened the door to call him to dinner during his attempting of the nice guy pose. He had tried to pretend he had just been examining his thumb, but Inari had kept giving him those odd looks all through the meal. Naruto announced during dinner that he had gotten work at Soba's shop to the surprise of all, he didn't go into details, just said that Akira had found a use for some of his unique skills. Apart from his announcement, supper was uneventful as Naruto had thankfully remembered to remove his forehead protector before coming down. Naruto again quickly escaped to his room as he wanted to get to bed early and had one more thing to do. He knew what being a missing nin could do to someone, and so he needed rules for himself, a new ninja way. He sat down with a piece of paper and started to write. Never leave a mission uncompleted, he figured this one was a given, but it felt good to write. Never do a mission because you are told or begged to, this was important as so many missions were a waste of time, 
and he couldn't afford to work on pity. Never go into a situation without knowing the way out, this was a rule he felt too many shinobi had died for forgetting. Never cut twice, Naruto thought of this as an analogy for life, always be sure to succeed on the first try because you may not get a second. Naruto looked at his list with satisfaction before folding it and sliding it into the slit in his forehead protector, cloth where he had only a short time ago hidden ramen tickets. He then changed and jumped into bed. As he lay there, staring at the ceiling, he reflected on how much his life had changed in a mere seven days. It had been two weeks since he had stumbled into Kanoha covered in blood, wasting his tears because the bastard had an unhealthy familial obsession. He had wasted a week moping about his stupid teammates, and in that same amount of time, he had forever changed his life for the better. That night, for the first time in his life, Naruto fell asleep with no fear as to what the next day would bring. Chapter 5, Sibling Bonding Special Disclaimer, UPS and Kool-Aid are owned by whoever owns them. Not me. It was not a good morning to be a tree. Naruto had now been in wave country a total of 15 days. After Metakira, his days were busy. He would get up, train in the forest with Kubai Kiri and his new Jutsus, break for lunch, go to work, arrive home just in time for supper, and it now being at least 7 o'clock, he had a couple hours of free time, which he usually spent training anyway, before he had to get to bed. This had gone well until two days, before when Naruto realized he needed to send his message to Kanoha soon or they would come and look for him. The problem was that he needed to send it in a way that it couldn't be traced back to wave country, he knew that if enough effort was spent, someone would remember him and his story would be blown. He needed the Kanoha records to show that he had killed himself due to emotional trauma, somewhere far away from wave, so he had come up with what he thought was a very clever plan. He had mailed his letter the day before and had been going insane with worry for the last 24 hours. He knew there were a million things that could go wrong. Unfortunately for the forest, the only way Naruto had found to vent his anxiety was to train with even more intensity, and the trees were covered in large slash marks. On the positive side, he had improved greatly and could now handle Kubai Kiri one handed without looking like an idiot. Naruto practiced for another 15 more minutes before collapsing into the grass and staring at the sky, breathing heavily and letting his mind wander. It was amazing how so little time could change one's perspective, so much. Naruto had always lived by hating those who killed without reason, and devoting his life to fighting against them without ever realizing he was being manipulated. What had he thought the Anbu had been doing his whole life? Orochimaru had tried to destroy the leaf and assassinated Sandam Hokage, but how many innocents had been killed in wars and skirmishes Kanoha had started? How many assassinations were performed by Leaf Shinobi in a month? A week? A day? Uchiha Itachi had killed his whole clan just to measure and improve himself. But the Hyuga had been regularly enslaving and killing each other for as long as village history recorded, and they were among the most respected of the Leaf clans. If he added himself, he had the group of people that Kanoha despised above all others and there was only one thing that they had in common. It wasn't their viciousness, their cruelty, or even whom they killed. It was because they had left the village. Nukunans were hunted because once someone escaped the grasp of loyalty their village had, they realized that all shinobi were the same. That their beloved village did the same things they were told made their enemies evil. Naruto glanced at the sun and realized with a start that he would be late for work. He leapt to his feet, his profound thoughts momentarily forgotten as he ran back towards the city. Later that day in the village of the hidden sand. Kankuro very slowly and very carefully examined the house, he shared with his siblings. Tamari had a date, he knew this meant she wouldn't be home until at least midnight, more likely one or two. Gara was of doing, whatever it was that Gara did, no one had ever bothered to figure out what that was, but he was never around. Kankuro giggled with delight, it was rare for him to have the house all to himself. He was just building up to full-fledged maniacal laughter when the doorbell rang. Kankuro froze, he hadn't even known they'd had a doorbell, if Tamari forgot her key and couldn't get in she just broke the door down, and Gara teleported with his sand. Kankuro opened the door to be confronted by a rather nervous, 
looking man in brown wearing a UPS hat. He opened the door a bit further, a worker of the United Postal Service meant a letter had been addressed to someone in his house. It was an unprecedented event. Kankaro opened the door all the way and looked at the man expectantly. I I I ha have have a, the man grew more confident as he continued, p, package for a Mr. Gara of the desert, is he here? The man asked, obviously hoping he wasn't. Kankaro, for one of the few times in his life, was speechless. It took him a moment to realize the man wanted a reply. Gara was upstairs, but this man didn't need to know that, Kankaro didn't want urine on the front stairs. No, but I'll make sure he gets it, Kankaro said with a fake smile. The man ran away from the house and Kankaro closed the door. What had he been doing again? A grin lit up his face, now he remembered. He tossed Gara's letter on the table and ran to his room, again checking that the coast was clear, he withdrew a DVD case from under his mattress and grinned stupidly over the title. Itcha Itcha Paradise, the motion picture. It was one of his favorite movies, he knew it was dumb, but loved it at the same time. But he rarely dared watch it with Tamari always waiting for an excuse to beat him senseless. He skipped down the stairs and tossed some popcorn into the microwave, waited impatiently while it cooked and dashed to the living room and dove onto the couch. The movie had only been on a couple of minutes when Kankaro felt a presence behind him. He felt every muscle in his body tighten as Gara calmly walked into his field of vision, over to the recliner next to the couch and, setting his gourd on the floor, sat down. Not entirely understanding what was going on but not willing to waste his Tamari free time, he started the movie again. Kankaro was normally fond of commenting on the stupidity of various characters, but felt insecure with Gara there. This feeling was quickly alleviated however. Don't drink the purple liquid just, because it's sitting there, have your brains leaked out of your head, or are you just a stupid pathetic waste of life? Gara yelled. Kankaro looked at his little brother as if he had grown another head, which honestly, would have surprised Kankaro less. Gara was yelling at the TV, at a porn movie, at his porn movie. The next time an appropriate scene cut in, Gara was about to speak, but Kankaro cut him off. Why would anyone with a fraction of a shred of a half, dead monkey's brain hit the big red button that says do not push? The two looked at each other, both with a little respect in their eyes. This went on for about the next 30 minutes, when disaster struck. The two heard the sound of the doorknob, turning and barely had time to look before a slightly dirty and very pissed looking Tamari stomped into the room. She was yelling something about stupid boys and strawberry Kool-Aid. She stormed over to the couch and sat down, shoving Kankaro over. It wasn't until a few moments later, during a break in her cursing, that she noticed what was playing on the TV. A man and a woman were in the front seat of a car entangled in a rather odd position while the man navigated the car through a sandstorm with his feet. The room went dead silent, except for the squeaking and moaning coming from the TV. Tamari's eyes widened, that position cannot be physically possible. It was then that the sand siblings found the first thing they had in common, commenting on dumb movies. It was the best time they had ever spent together. There was a brief interlude where Kankaro paused the movie to, with the help of some life-sized sand models courtesy of Gara, prove that the earlier mentioned position was in fact possible, if extremely painful. As the movie ended, the three realized that they had just enjoyed a whole two hours of each other's company, and were actually sad that the movie was over. That was until Gara reached into his gourd and tossed another DVD to Kankaro. This one was Itcha Itcha Paradise 2, Revenge of the Squid. Kankaro looked at his brother in wonder. This isn't supposed to come out for another month. Why do you have this? Kankaro demanded to know. Gara shrugged and gestured to the still rolling credits of the first movie. Special effects team. Visual effects, Kurosaki Ichigo. Creature effects, Abarai Renji. Sandstorm and weather effects, Gara of the Desert. The two elder siblings stared at their younger brother until he raised a non-existent eyebrow at them and gestured towards the machine. It was well past one o'clock, when the second movie, finished and they were all heading off to bed, on the way up, Gara noticed a large envelope, on the table, and was surprised to see it addressed to him. 
He took it upstairs and ripped it open to find a second envelope and a note. Dear Gara, this may seem a bit weird to you, but it's really important that you follow the instructions in this letter. If I ever see you again, I'll tell you why. Whatever day tomorrow is, I need you to use Henge to transform into me. Then take the letter in the envelope I sent to the courier and have it sent straight to the office of the Hokage, then go into the desert, release the Henge, and go back to whatever it is you do. In a few weeks, people will come by asking about me. Tell them you only met me once, and that we talked about hate and the pain of life and other angsty stuff. Tell them I then disappeared into the desert, without a trace. I owe you big time. Naruto. At the bottom of the letter was a scribbled drawing of a stick figure with fox whiskers. Gara woke up the next day and did what Naruto asked. He really didn't have anything better to do and figured Naruto wouldn't ask if it wasn't important. It also gave him something to do for a few weeks. He needed to practice his angst. Now, back to wave country. Two more days had passed and Naruto was mostly done, worrying about the letter, but in its stead got something else to worry about. He had overlooked one thing in his disguise, his eyes. Contrasted to the rest of his dark outfit, his eyes were a piercing shade of blue and very recognizable. The thing was, he thought knew of a way to change his eye color, but it would require a great deal of research, be very dangerous and guarantee that he would never be allowed in Kanoha again. He did a double take and realized that he really didn't have a problem with any of those. He was really starting to like being a Nukunen. Now having spent two and a half weeks in wave country, Naruto started to think about departure plans. Akira had offered to make the two gravestones free of charge and Naruto had set them in place the day before. He had been making money by the bucket load and figured he wouldn't need to start taking missions for a while, which was good. Naruto had been spending more and more time in the forest, he had gained enough control to make Hirogakure no Jutsu a powerful if not perfect skill and was improving his sword technique every day. It was therein that the problem lay. The more Naruto trained, the more he realized that he had many things to work on. His sword was in need of repair, his working with Akira had taught him a thing or two about metal, and the sword had been old when Zabuza had owned it. He would have to find a master swordsmith if he wanted a good job done on a sword this unique. Most smiths, even good ones, just dealt with the basic swords, katanas, ninjatas, wakazashas, etc. His second problem was that training his body wasn't enough. He feared the first time, he thought it would become painfully obvious that three weeks of experimentation was no match for a 200-year-old sword style. He needed to learn how to fight with his sword, not just swing it. He figured the first one was more important, because he still had his old jutsus and could fight barehanded, but sword experience was useless if your sword was broken. Now hoping to leave wave country in less than 10 days, Naruto threw himself into his training even more and added into his daily schedule an hour at the local library. It wasn't as extensive as Kanaha's, but Naruto found enough books on seals to give him a pretty good idea of what he would have to do to change his eye color. It wouldn't be particularly complex, just insanely dangerous. Naruto made a note to test this particular jutsu somewhere far away from. Well. Anything. With his having roughly planned his departure date, time sped by even faster. Before he knew it, his fourth week in wave country was coming to an end. Today was Friday and Naruto planned to leave this Sunday. That meant today would be his last day working for Akira and Naruto was surprised to find that he would miss the man. As today was his last day, he felt there was a question to ask, but he wasn't quite sure how to do it. Naruto had been careful to never give any indication as to why he was here and for all Akira knew, racing gan could be a beginning level jutsu. Naruto approached what passed for his boss's office and fidgeted for a moment. Akira glanced up, is there something I can help you with, Naruto? He asked. Yeah. I've already told you that I'm leaving Sunday, but before I go, I need you to promise never to repeat any of this and answer a question without asking why. Akira gave him an odd look, but nodded. I want to know who the best swordsmith on he continent is, and where I could probably find him. Naruto let out a breath. 
If Kanoha Hunter Nin were given the answer to this question and knew he had asked it, he would be thoroughly screwed. Then, to Naruto's surprise, Akira laughed. That's what you wanted to ask. I was afraid there for a second. It's really an easy question, Kirin is by far the best. No one knows his last name, but he was the youngest of three brothers, all of whom were forced to flee from the hidden mist when the oldest went rogue. Kirin himself made four of the seven legendary mist swords, and the middle brother, now dead, made the other three. It's quite a well-known tale in the metal working community. Kirin is somewhat of an idol. Akira took a breath and looked uncertain for a moment. Finding him may be more difficult. He was last known to have taken shelter in another village in the north. Some claim a place called the Village of the Hidden Sound, but I don't honestly believe such a place exists, so all I can tell you is go north. It was at this point that Naruto stopped listening. The fates, he decided, had a very twisted sense of humor. Naruto waved goodbye to the man who had been his boss and friend for the better part of a month and headed straight home. He hadn't told Tazuna of his plans to leave and didn't intend to. Naruto would be gone long before sunrise the next morning and would leave an apologetic note, claiming that a top-secret mission required his presence immediately. A PS reminded the family not to admit to anyone that he had been there, not even his own teammates. Naruto went to sleep that night with a sense of trepidation. Now having a solution, though a potentially unpleasant one, to the dilemma of how to repair Kubai Kirihusha, he had set his sights on, how he might improve his proficiency with it. A regular sword master could teach him some basic forms, but Zaboza had not needed a style, he had simply fought with the sword as an extension of his body, and for Naruto to have any less skill would be an insult to the sword and its previous master. Naruto needed to learn from someone who knew and understood how fight with a weapon of this size. They would have to have no associations with any hidden village friendly to Kanoha, and ideally, they would also know the various water jutsus that complemented the use of such huge weapons. The longer Naruto thought about this, the more it disturbed him. The problem wasn't that he didn't know anyone who fit these criteria, the problem was that he did. Bonus. Naruto's new look, stealthy and stylish. Hair, maroon. Vest, navy. Pants, black. Why these three colors you ask? All three are very distinctive in light, the hair looks red, the vest blue, and the pants black. But when night rolls around or visibility gets bad, say, in thick mist all the colors just look dark. Anyone describing Naruto to an authority or a hunter, Nin would describe the cloths as dark or black. People tend to make a noticeable mistake in these situations when told his cloths were dark. They tend to automatically assume the cloths were all the same color. The next obvious question is, why the vest with no shirt underneath? To which the answer is also quite simple. Fighting with an 80-pound sword requires mobility, and if one isn't going to wear any armor, why bother with a shirt? The ninja vest is really a requirement, but anything else is just something to get in the way. It should be noted that Zabuza never wore anything on his upper body, but he had Haku to carry all the emergency supplies, the open vest also allows his seal to show, which adds to his intimidation. Chapter 6, Collecting Rent The next morning, Naruto woke up at 3 a.m., he carefully and quietly packed his few possessions into a small duffel bag Tazuna had given him to keep his clothes in. He zipped it up and crept downstairs. He left his note sitting on the kitchen table, where Tazuna would undoubtedly find it when he came down for his morning tea. Saying a silent goodbye to the house and the people who lived there, he walked out of the house, closing the door behind him. Kubai Kiri Husha was, as always, exactly where Naruto had left it on the roof. Naruto had started to feel more comfortable with the sword nearby and felt nervous when it wasn't within his range of perception. Naruto stood atop the house and looked around at his surroundings. He imagined all the sleeping citizens of Wave Country completely oblivious to the one who would be leaving them tonight. Naruto jumped down from the roof and started to run. He ran out of the city into the forest, much as he had run from another city, but a short month ago. But there was a difference. As he had fled Kanoha, he had been plagued by memories of the past. But this time, as he left the still sleeping port city behind him, his thoughts were on the future. 
As the morning plodded on, Naruto continued to run through the forest. He was now in fire country, and probably would be for quite some time. It was the only direct land route from wave to sound and Naruto wasn't good with ships. Going the most direct way would take him within 40 miles of Konoha, but Naruto wasn't prepared to be that cocky yet, so he had planned a slightly out-of-the-way route that would keep him a safe distance away. As the sun rose towards the peak of its path and noon approached, Naruto realized he'd been stalling long enough. After all, it had been hours since he had seen any signs of human life. Stealing his resolve, he set down his bag and sword on he ground near a particularly tall tree and ran another minute through the forest. Sweaty and out of breath, but by no means out of stamina, Naruto sought to calm himself. He was about to attempt an experimental jutsu, and wanted to at least be calm, so he didn't make any mistakes. He closed his eyes and calmed his spirit. His eyes shot open and in one fluid motion, he bit his thumb and streaked a line of blood down, the seal on his belly. He moved his hands faster than the normal human eye could track. There were 37 hand seals. He finished on the dragon seal, and called out to the empty forest. Shikifujin Kai. He found himself in the familiar landscape of his cave-like mind. He had been expecting this, but it unnerved him nonetheless, particularly considering what he was expecting at the end of the tunnel. He walked into the large room that held the Kyubi's cage. The jutsu had worked, and he had used enough chakra. The evidence of this was, that is was flying around the room, forming a swirling vortex of blue energy, and as he watched, the seal holding QB in his cage started to glow and stretch and the great iron door started to open. What are you doing, brat? Kyubi's voice called, sounding as confused as Naruto had ever heard QB sound. The seal stretched more and more and the gates opened wider and wider. The demon figured he had to be suffering some kind of mental breakdown, but wasn't willing to let opportunity escape. As soon as the gates were open enough, Kyubi stuck a paw through the gap and sent it hurling towards Naruto, hoping to crush his mind and take over the body. Naruto saw the huge clawed appendage coming towards him and it took every ounce of his willpower to wait as long as he did. As the claw was fractions of a second away from making his body into a demon puppet, Naruto released the jutsu. The blue chakra in the room immediately vanished. The seal lost its glow and the gate slammed shut, cleanly severing the front, right leg of the QB, which quickly disintegrated into a wave of red chakra that washed over him. Naruto was sucked from his mind world with the screams of the demon following him. Naruto awoke in the real world to discover a new meaning for the word pain. It felt like every muscle and bone in his body was both expanding and contracting at the same time as a hurricane of red chakra tore apart the surrounding area of forest. After about a minute, the chakra vanished until Naruto was just left lying on the grass, staring at clouds. He slowly drifted off to sleep thinking, for a demon thousands of years old, that fox is pretty stupid. Naruto awoke to find the sun rising, and realized he had slept for 18 hours. He eagerly examined his body, and was disappointed when he saw that the changes had been minor. He had gained a bit of muscle mass and grown maybe 3 inches. He also molded some chakra and found that he had gained some extra reserves of that as well. Naruto maintained his slightly depressed state all the way to the location of his stash, because it is then that, he saw his reflection in Kubaikiri's blade. His eyes were slightly slitted and had become a bit more angular. They had lost their innocent, blue shade and had turned to the red normally reserved for when he went into one of his insane rages. Naruto had figured some time ago that channeling insane amounts of Kyubi's chakra might enhance his body, but he had needed a way to get that much. It was then that he had come upon the idea of the Shikifujin Kai. It had stood to reason that since jutsus like the shadow bind could be broken with raw chakra, it would also be possible to, if temporarily, bend the seal and trick the QB exactly as he had done. Many months of research later, Naruto had ditched the idea, he had realized that taking power from the QB might very well give the villagers the excuse they needed to kill him. In retrospect, he had been right to ditch the jutsu then, but he was glad he had done the research. All in all, his experimental jutsu was a success. He was sure Kyubi would never fall for the same trick again, but his eye change alone was worth it.
Eye color was mostly impossible to change without Genjutsu, so he might even be able to bluff his way out of a situation where he had already been recognized. Satisfied and refreshed from his long nap, Naruto checked his map and compass before bounding off through the forest. Meanwhile, in Konoha, the fifth Hokage lay on her desk, with her eyes staring blankly off into empty space. Her face was soaked with tears, as was the letter she clutched desperately in her right hand. She had sent a squad of Anbu to the sand the day before, despite the protest of the whole council, and had spent every moment since dreading their report. She refused to believe that Naruto was dead by his own hand, he had always had such an unbreakable spirit but as the days passed, Tsunade had started to remember things. Images of him being jeered at by shockers, hit by children throwing rotten fruit, screamed at by parents for asking to play with their child. All these things had also been part of Naruto's past. And Tsunade herself wasn't sure if she could handle that kind of treatment for 13 years. She had been crying for two days, but with these thoughts and memories haunting her, she started to convert her sadness to anger. However she looked at it, this whole mess was Orochimaru's fault. He had been the one to steal Sasuke from the village and shatter Naruto's frail trust. The more she thought about it, the angrier she got. Until she decided that if those Anbu came back confirming the death of her third precious person, she would burn the sound to the ground, if she had to do it with her in two hands. Far away, a green necklace lay forgotten in the bottom of Naruto's duffel bag. Chapter 7, Don't Touch the Weasel's Pocky Naruto sat in the forest rubbing his feet. His boots were lying next to him on the forest floor, and he glared menacingly at them. He had only been running a couple hours when his feet had started to sting, and a short time later he couldn't run anymore. He quickly discovered the problem, after bathing in demonic chakra, his feet had gotten larger. Not by any significant amount, only a few fractions of an inch, but it was enough to make his boots pinch. Naruto had expected a slight body size increase, he just hadn't accounted for all the problems it would cause. This, he decided, was the less glamorous side of transformation jutsus. A quick once-over had also shown that he would need to have the hems on his pants let out as they hung a good inch and a bit above his ankles, showing off skin. He had a sudden moment of pity for Kimuro, the poor guy must have spent all his money on fixing holes in his clothing. This line of thought was amusing, but didn't help Naruto decide what to do about his boots. He was 70 miles from the nearest town. He continued to rub his foot, trying to get the blood circulation again. After 10 minutes or so, an idea finally came to him. He took a kunai out of his holster and started hacking at one of his boots. In three minutes, he had a usable if not particularly good, looking pair of what he thought of as ninja sandals. He had really just cut the top off his boots and used the extra material to tie his feet into the bottoms. Now again mobile, Naruto got to his feet, picked up his bag and sword and started off through the forest. Some 50 miles north of Naruto's current position, Uchiha Itachi was shopping for Paki. He stood among the many flavors and tried vainly to decide. It was a little-known fact that the most deadly Nukunin in Kanoha history had an obsession with the chocolatey snack. He had eaten three packs a day for years and had only stopped eating them in combat when a group of grass jounin had burst out laughing as he happily munched. Needless to say, he continued to munch as he ripped them to shreds, but after that decided to keep eating and fighting separate. He had abstained from his Akatsuki cloak today and had a pencil carefully tucked behind his ear. He and his partner had decided long ago that Itachi was the one who handled shopping and Kasami was the one who managed their money. That way, Itachi got what he wanted and his partner could decide how much of it he got. His pocky limit for the week was 15 boxes. He sat down in the aisle and let his eyes roam over the various shelves. He had to choose carefully, but he was patient, and he knew that the answers would come to him in time. Naruto looked at the sun he had made good progress. He was hoping to get out of fire country as fast as he could and hadn't, even stopped to get new shoes in the last town. He had passed through, though this could also be partly attributed to the fact that he didn't want anyone to see him. He continued to run and pondered his high endurance. Weeks of training all morning and raising an ing all afternoon had given him a substantial boost to his stamina, 
and he was managing the weight of Kubai Kiri who saw better every day. Proof of this was that he had been running most of the morning and still had some energy left. Stopping at the base of a tree for a short breather, Naruto tried to decide what he would actually do when he arrived at the village of the Hidden Sound, he had serious doubts about just walking up to the gates knocking. He had no intention of joining the sound, so he would need to find another way in, and knowing Rochimaru, he would have to give something up in exchange for what he wanted. He continued to ponder, completely unaware of the presence far above him in the treetops. Hoshigaki Kasami stared down at the oblivious boy. This was undoubtedly the source of the weird chakra surge Same Hada had picked up the day before, but to find him with Kubai Kiri Husha. Kasami would have normally immediately killed anyone who would dare take one of the seven Mist Tankin as his own, but Same Hada had given some very odd results about his chakra. Kasami never forgot the feel of a person's chakra. Ever. This boy, alone in the wilderness, with a new forehead protector, looking completely different and carrying Azusa's sword was most definitely the QB brat. Kasami could immediately tell Had had left his village, if not for his chakra, he would never have recognized the boy. He tried to think of what could draw him out here, the only thing in the direction he was traveling was hidden sound. He looked at the sword again and his eyes widened. The boy must have gotten the sword recently, Kasami had made a note to know where it was and last he had heard it was marking the demon's grave. It made perfect sense, the sword was in need of repair, and so the brat would obviously need someone to fix it. A plan was starting to form in Kaizam's mind, but for it to work, the boy would have to know how to handle his weapon. He glanced at the sun. Considering the distance to the store and the 15 box of Pocky limit, Kasami figured he had about two hours before Itachi got back. Plenty of time. His hands flashed through seals and he whispered, Kirigakur no jutsu. Naruto was just getting ready to start on his way again when he noticed the mist starting to fill the area, immediately dropping his bag. He dove into the bushes, uncovering Kubai Kiri as he ran through the brush. The mist grew thicker and Naruto jumped into a tree to try to get a better view of the area. He was trying to figure out who could be doing this, and the only answer he could come up with was Mist Hunter Nin, but that made no sense. His thoughts were quickly interrupted as his instincts screamed at him. He leapt off the branch right as it exploded. Two phantoms did a dance of destruction through the forest. A slight disturbance in the mist would be the only warning, and they'd be at each other, exchanging blows faster than the normal, human eye could follow, before both vanishing back into the mist. The air was dead silent, neither fighter made a sound as they silently stalked one another. Both knew there was no time for attempting other jutsus, the second one of them was off guard, the other would strike. Still somewhere far away, Itachi was reaching for his ninth box of Pocky, when he quickly withdrew his hand, he couldn't allow himself to be hasty in his choice. Naruto cursed silently as he looked out into the impenetrable fog. He knew he had the disadvantage, Kasami had a better understanding of Kirigakur no Jutsu, and so Naruto was fighting blind, on pure instinct. And then there was the small issue of Kasami being a Jounin. He was using every ounce of strength and flexibility he had just to avoid same Hada. But then again, he shouldn't be able to avoid same Hada at all. He ran through the forest trying to figure this out, Kasami was holding back, he knew it, but why? And for that matter, why was the shark man here in the first place? Naruto had no more time for thought as same Hada came hurling out of the mist. He jumped over where he knew Kasami was standing and twisted in midair bringing Kubai Kiri around to block the inevitable follow-up strike. But it never came. Realizing he'd been tricked, Naruto tried to compensate, but he was off balance and landed poorly. The last thing he felt was an impact on his left arm. The mist slowly cleared as Kasami looked thoughtfully at the unconscious boy. The fight had taken less than two minutes and in that time, Naruto had demonstrated that he had absolutely no idea how to use his sword, and that was exactly why Kasami had been so impressed. The brat had held him a bay for two minutes, and even with Kasami holding back more than two-thirds of his power, that was still quite a feat. Sighing, he picked up the boy and slung him over his shoulder before stooping to pick up Kubai Kiri. 
Itachi wasn't going to be happy about this, so Kasami had a feeling that he would have to double next week's Pocky budget. Naruto's first thought as he started to come around was that, he must be in heaven, because his nose was full of the smell of fresh ramen. Just as he was opening his eyes, however, the ramen was taken away. Wake up, brat, Kasami said impatiently, we need to have a little talk before Itachi gets back. Naruto was suddenly fully awake and examining his surroundings. He was relieved to see both Kubai Kiri and his bag in good condition. He was less pleased, however, with being tied to a tree and towered over by an annoying shark man. He would later think up many things he could have said at this moment, but settled for the first thing that came to mind. Why aren't I dead? Naruto asked. Kasami didn't even miss a beat, because I need to ask you some things, he replied. Naruto blinked, he supposed that made sense. Ask away. Kasami started simple, he grabbed Kubai Kiri and held it out in front of Naruto, where did you get this? Naruto went over his options and decided this was another case where his don't lie to people who can kick your ass theory applied. See chapter point 3, he also realized that explaining where he got the sword would only make sense if he explained why he had left Konoha. One thing led to another and Naruto spent the next 10 minutes essentially summarizing everything that had transpired in the last month and a bit. Kasami had been silent the whole time, but was ecstatic. This would be perfect, the situation couldn't have worked out better if some had planned it. Author twiddles his thumbs innocently. Tell you what, Kasami said, I'll give you some help with your atrocious sword skills and help you get into, hidden sound to find Hoshigaki Kirin, and all I want in return is for you to help me out with something. Naruto started to say something, then stopped as he noticed Kaizam's smirk and reprocessed what he had just said. Oh. Was the most intelligent reply Naruto could come up with. So, Kasami started again, do we have a deal, brat? Naruto realized that even if he hadn't needed help getting into sound, he really didn't have a choice in the matter seeing as how he was tied to a tree and helpless. He nodded slowly. Good, Kasami said with a grin. He cut Naruto's bindings that set the bowl of ramen in front of the ravenous boy. Eat quick, brat Kasami called as he tossed Naruto some chopsticks. Itachi left the store and headed back to camp satisfied, it had taken him 3 hours and 43 minutes, but he had decided on what flavors he wanted. He was munching on a stick of white chocolate cream when he came upon the scene of a young boy with red eyes practicing with a giant sword in the middle of his camp. Itachi pulled out his box of Pocky and carefully read the ingredients, but nothing seemed suspicious. He looked again, the boy was still there, he activated his sharing gan, and the boy was still there. He was about to introduce one of his kunai to the boy's neck when he felt Kasami land beside him. He turned and glared at his partner. Explain. Kasami then once again summarized the summary Naruto had given him just a few minutes before, finishing the explanation with, so he can get what he wants from my brother and we get a reliable agent in the hidden sound. Everyone leaves happy. Itachi thought for a moment. As much as he hated to admit it, and he most definitely hated to admit it, Kasami had a point. It was rare, but not unheard of for Akatsuki to work with other missing nins, and this boy might save them a lot of trouble. Every 18 months, Kasami and Itachi took a break from Akatsuki work to go visit Hoshigaki Kirin, Kaizam's brother. Kasami went to get his sword checked and fixed, and Itachi just went because it was a break from working all the time. At the end of every visit, they would agree on where they would meet the next time. Unfortunately, Mist Hunters had forced Kirin to flee from the agreed location and seek sanctuary in the Hidden Sound. This posed a slight problem, as it was unlikely, Orochimaru would let the two strongest members of the Akatsuki 9 just waltz into his village for a quick visit with his new best weaponsmith. They had been planning on getting a sound Jounin to deliver a message for them. Find a squad and kill all the members but one, then threaten the last one until he did what they wanted. This had worked before, but was messy and left a trail. Kasami actually cared about his brother and had been concerned that this method might put him in danger. Kasami had suspected that Naruto might be looking for his brother as soon as he saw Kubai Kiri Husha and had decided that he would be a far better agent. 
First of all, Naruto had no reason, or, less of a reason, to betray them. Second of all, Naruto needed the help of Kasami and his brother if he ever wanted to be more than an amateur with a beat-up sword. Thirdly, he had a valid reason to be in the Sound Village and to talk to Kirin. The final, and perhaps greatest advantage was that Fushikao Naruto didn't exist. No matter how deep they delved, or how far they searched, no one would be able to find any trace of anyone with his name or description. He had no home village, no friends, no past. Kasami went over all this and the only thing that stopped Itachi for immediately agreeing was that this boy had been the target of a failed mission and Itachi hated to fail missions. The council had been annoyed with them for weeks. Itachi's internal war finally ended with him agreeing to work with the brat. The boy was, after all, now a missing nin, and if they didn't help each other out once in a while the villages would kill them of one by one until no one would have the courage to leave. The other, and far more important reason was that the two Akatsuki really needed someone's help, but Itachi would never admit that to himself. Naruto had known the two were somewhere nearby, but that didn't stop him from jumping slightly as two forms emerged from the forest. He blinked. The last time they had met, Naruto had been overcome by Itachi's sheer aura of power, turned out that effect was diminished slightly when he was without his cloak and carrying shopping bags. Now, instead of looking like an incarnation of death, he just looked like an older version of Sasuke with a pocky addiction. Dinner that evening was awkward at first. This was primarily due to the fact that shortly after sitting down, Naruto came to a startling realization. S-class missing nins were people. It had come as the greatest shock of his life when Itachi had set up a campfire and started to fry some meat in a pan. Their food was simple, noodles and fried chicken, but Itachi turned out to be a very good cook. Naruto was surprised again when the two Akatsuki started to chat about pointless non-death related things. Contrary to what he might have thought, the older Uchiha was far more talkative than his younger brother had been. After a while, Naruto found himself getting used to the idle way the two deadly shinobi discussed the next day's meals between bites of chicken. He even started to add the occasional comment to their conversation. Supper was quickly finished and the topic of discussion turned to their task, Naruto now actively joined in. Kasami was tired of watching his brother run, but the only way to get the hunters off his trail was if they believed he was dead. So their task was twofold, they had to get Kirin out of the hidden village of sound undetected, and make it look as if he had died in a way such that the body could never be recovered. If so much as a single sighting of Kasami or Itachi were made, the plan would be blown as everyone would suspect a plot. Unfortunately, Kirin's connection to members of Akatsuki was far better known in the world of Shinobi than it was in the world of metalworkers. That meant that everything would hinge on Naruto. They decided he would infiltrate the village as who he was, a young man looking to get his sword repaired. Unlike most hidden village leaders, Orochimaru allowed Nukunins to both live in and visit his village, some took missions, others didn't, but Orochimaru figured that they would help if the village were attacked. It was like having a free defense force, people fighting to protect the sound not because they were paid to, but because it was the only place that would accept them. It was sad and brilliant at the same time. It was decided that Naruto would pose as a child of one of the missed nin who had run away with Zabuza. He would claim that his father had been killed recently. This story, combined with a few bribes, would allow him to enter the village with minimal attention. The three continued to plan long into the night, unaware that somewhere far away, another plan was in the making. Gara stood before the Hokage with his siblings, giving his report. Surrounding him were the few in the village interested in Naruto's fate. He had been speaking for just over an hour, and from his first word he had every ounce of attention in that room focused on him. He wove a tale of sadness and depression, so dark it tore at the heartstrings of even the most cold-hearted Jounin. It was a tale of a broken boy who had come to see the only other person on the planet like him before he threw his life into the sands of the desert. He described the conversation he had had with Naruto in minute detail, every word, every facial expression, and every gesture. It was all, of course, a complete lie. Finally, he finished with, then I saw his form slowly vanish into the desert.
Gara took a step back, very proud of himself. He wouldn't doubt that he had just given the best angsty speech anyone in the room had ever heard. Though he admitted that watching Rockley sob and hug his teacher for an hour had unnerved him a little bit. It had only been moments after the Anbu arrived at his door that he realized what Naruto had done. He had wondered the whole way here whether he would be able to lie to the Hokage herself. Then he had seen the parties in the streets. Bars offering free liquor, huge signs waving in the wind reading Ding, Dong, the demon's dead. Most of Kanoha was celebrating. A few people were indifferent, and here, in this room with him, were the only ones who felt even a tinge of sadness at the thought of Naruto being dead. His eyes roamed around the room. The Hokage had started to cry silently halfway through his story and the man called Dreo was holding her hand. The elder Hyuga child had his eyes tightly shut was evidently trying to hold his emotions in check while his younger sister, or cousin, Gara wasn't sure, clung to him, sobbing. Noticeably missing were Naruto's remaining teammate and teacher. Gara glared. How dare these people think they had the right to be sad? Where did they think they had been when Naruto had needed them? The people of this village didn't deserve the truth. Gara continued to be angry, even after the Hokage composed herself and thanked him. It was Orochimaru's fault. It followed Insanade's mind that Sasuke had left because of Orochimaru and Naruto had, she had trouble even thinking it, killed himself because Sasuke had left, therefore, it was Orochimaru's fault. Insanade stood and looked at the few gathered before her. There has been, she declared, far too much sadness in this village. So much that it will be many years before life gets back to normal. But in this time, I ask you to be strong, and help me to eliminate the source of this sadness. Tsunade slammed her fist into her desk, shattering it. I want every available shinobi called in from whatever mission they're on, from the Anbu to the Genin, I want them all here. She turned to Shizun, get our strategists working on a plan. One month from now, we will crush Orochimaru and his village of sound, and end this circle of sadness forever. The Hokage spun and stormed out of the room, leaving a stunned audience behind her. Shikamaru sighed, troublesome. Back in the forest, Naruto lay sleeping silently near the now extinguished campfire. Deeper in the woods, Itachi and Kasami were washing their clothes in the river by moonlight. They were silent for the first few moments each having things to contemplate. Itachi looked at his partner and decided he needed to break the silence. Don't even start thinking about it Kasami, the council would never allow us to have a dependent, he would just slow us down. Kasami growled slightly as he tried to get a sweat stain out of his shirt. I'm perfectly aware of that, but looking at him is a lot like looking into the past isn't it Itachi? Itachi could only nod. He remembered well what it was like during his first year as a missing nin. It had been hard, and he had been a jounin when he left. Naruto was Shayunin level at best. No, he knew all too well that once Kanoha found out Naruto was alive and they would, eventually, the next few months, after would probably be the most difficult of Naruto's life if he were still alive at the end of them. Kasami cut into Itachi's thoughts, we could at least help him get stronger and teach him enough to survive. He said, it's three days to hidden sound if we move quickly, but we have all the time we need, so why not take two weeks and teach him a few tricks, then we go our separate ways after we're done, in sound and the council won't even need to know he exists. Itachi gave no response to Kaizam's suggestion, but it didn't matter. They had both known he'd agree before the words had come out of his partner's mouth. It had been said once that if you looked as missing nin society as a whole, it functioned very much like a hidden village. Mission information was carried by rumors instead of scrolls, but there were definite ranks and the older nins often passed on their experience to the younger ones. Itachi now understood why that was. Not out of any particular like for Naruto personally, but because in looking at him, Itachi inevitably saw some part of himself. Bonus, physics of big ass swords. Having a decent knowledge of rotational motion is a necessity for any decent swordsman. The first fact is that the distribution of mass is very important. The further the mass is from your body, the more energy needed to move the sword. But then enters the law of conservation of energy. Say you want to swing the sword around in a circle once, 
360 degrees in one second. And say that, if you hold the sword at the end of the handle and away from your body, it takes 5 units of energy to swing it. If you hold the sword at the top of the handle, near the hilt of the blade and close to your body, it will only take 3 units of energy to move the sword around in a circle. But since energy can never be created or destroyed under normal circumstances, if one were to start swinging the sword at arm's length, giving it 5 units of energy, and then pull the sword in close to your body, the swing will actually speed up to compensate. The opposite is also true, if you start a swing in close to your body, then extend your arm, the speed of the strike will decrease. Chapter 8, Ironic. The next morning, Naruto was kicked awake at 5.30 and told that he had to get up and train. Kasami handed him Kubai Kiri and started dragging the still groggy Naruto out to a clearing. He then drew same Hada and started to explain. Okay, brat, listen up. Itachi and I don't think you're ready for this mission yet, so you're going to be getting a two-week crash course on how to be a missing nin. Your mornings will be spent doing taijutsu and swordsmanship training with me, and your afternoons will be devoted to Itachi teaching you the more general skills you'll need to stay alive. With no more words, Kasami charged. Caught unaware, Naruto was slammed fully awake as he tried to parry Kaizam's first strike. Tried being the operative word. He was thrown backwards by the force of the blow. The next two hours were spent pretty much like that. Kasami attacked from somewhere, Naruto tried to block. It took 45 minutes for Naruto figured out that this was not strength, but creativity and instinct training. Naruto figured out early on that he could never overpower than Shark Man, but he found there were tricks he could use. After trying to deflect Shuriken with his sword the way he would with a kunai the first few times, he realized that if he turned the sword sideways, it was wide enough to shield him completely. He also found that the best way to block Kaizam's attacks was to counter attack. If they both charged each other at the same time, Kasami would lose the momentum advantage he had when Naruto was just standing there, waiting for the impact. Sometime around 7.30 they had breakfast, Kasami and Naruto had bacon and eggs, Itachi had orange pocky. Right after breakfast they were back to training, only this time Kasami was actually teaching. He took Naruto through the basics of holding and swinging a sword, and then taught him some basic routines to practice. Kasami felt this was very important, because he had seen some moments in their pre-breakfast practice where Naruto had pulled off a truly amazing block only to be overpowered because he was holding the sword in the wrong place or at the wrong angle. By the time lunch rolled around, Naruto was exhausted. After lunch, Itachi replaced Kasami, took one look at him and declared he needed new shoes. Naruto was still wearing his now rather beat up impromptu sandals, he had made from the remains of his boots. It was for this reason that Naruto found himself in a shoe store in the nearest town an hour later. Naruto had complained that it was a long run for shoes until Itachi mentioned that he sometimes ran for half a day to get his weekly pocky supply. Naruto blindly picked out a pair of boots, which Itachi carefully examined before nodding. Naruto paid for the shoes and they ran all the way back to camp. Naruto, now completely wiped, glared at Itachi across what he had now come to call the training field. Suddenly, without warning, the old Itachi was back, the one that used to give him nightmares. Naruto's body ceased to function as every part of him screamed for him to run, but he couldn't move. Just as quickly, the feeling was gone and Naruto looked at Itachi in awe as the Sharingan user pulled out a stick of banana cream pocky and started to eat it. Today's lesson, Itachi said between bites, is for you to figure out what I just did. I'll repeat it as many times as you like. And he did just that. The first few times, Naruto was just as shocked and frozen as the first. But slowly, as the afternoon went on, he started to resist the feelings, and as he did, he started notice little things. The way Itachi shifted his posture slightly. The way his eyes narrowed. The way he angled his head. The way his muscles tightened. The list went on and on until suddenly, Naruto's eyes widened in understanding. Itachi wasn't moving, but somehow. It's everything, Naruto said, you're changing everything. Itachi nodded slightly. Orochimaru calls this killing intent, he said, but what it really is, is the accumulation of fear stimulus. 
Seeing the blank look in Naruto's eyes, Itachi tried to come up with another way to explain it. What do people do when you glare at them with your red eyes? Itachi asked. They get afraid? Naruto responded hesitantly. Exactly. And what do they do when you bare your fangs at them? Itachi asked again. Um. They get more afraid, Naruto responded, wondering where this was going. Itachi continued on, right again. But, Naruto, we are a race that has huge numbers of instincts that we never need to use anymore, instincts left over from when we were primitive hunters. And there are over a hundred more subtle movements that automatically set off a fear reaction in humans. Naruto felt a chill run down his back and Itachi continued on. I just shifted my weight as if I was going to attack and I'm sure you felt some fear. Naruto nodded. So if I were to do 40 or 50 small motions at once each of which triggered a small fear reaction. They would build up into a paralyzing terror. Naruto finished. Naruto though about it for a moment, then grinned, exposing his fangs. Teach me. Naruto spent the rest of the day, subjected to Itachi's fear stimulus as it was explained that he couldn't learn the technique himself until he was fully able to resist its effect. Naruto had absolutely no energy by the time supper rolled around, and went to bed especially early, as Kaizam smirk promised another, 5.30 wake up. It was in this way that the first week passed, and at this time, both his teachers were impressed with his progress. He wasn't a genius by any means, but his incredible endurance and work ethic made up for it. In six days' time Naruto had learned the basics of handling his sword, and had refined and smoothed his motions. He had also learned 15 of the 36 fear stimulus Itachi was planning on teaching him. He had yet to successfully use them all together, but he was working on it. On the seventh day, it was time for Itachi to go shopping for food and Paki, and it was decided that Naruto would accompany him. On the way to town, Itachi started a conversation about dealing with clients as a missing nin. So say you find out that a client wants to meet you at a certain place and time, Itachi said, what do you do? Naruto thought for a moment, I'd send a clone and watch from a distance, he said. Wrong, Itachi said firmly, don't you think Hunter Nin's plan for that sort of thing? You should go yourself to meet the client, anything less would be insulting, but use at least six clones as sentries. You don't care if the Hunter Nins find you, if they are stronger than you then you're doomed either way, because they will always find you eventually. You just always want to know when they're coming. It's also good to remember that if you are caught in a sting operation, whoever is posing as the client can be used as a hostage or human shield. Naruto absorbed all this information as they arrived in Own. Itachi handed him a shopping list and disappeared to the snack store, leaving Naruto to get all the regular food. Two hours later, both were done their respective tasks, but Itachi wanted to make one more stop. What do you mean? I need a new sword wrapping. Naruto growled. Your current one is too difficult to remove in combat, and falls off too easily, instead of one large piece of cloth that you fold around it, we're going to get you a long strip of cloth to wrap around it, much as Kasami does. Itachi replied calmly. Twenty minutes later, Naruto was heading back to camp with a week's worth of groceries and sixty feet of what looked to him like bandages. The only reason he wasn't complaining more than he was was that Itachi had paid. After arriving back at camp, things soon fell back into routine and before Naruto knew it, four more days had passed and they were on their way to the hidden sound. During the three-day trip, they planned and trained, spending every spare minute in preparation. They stopped a day from the sound as the last twelve hours of the journey, Naruto would have to make a loan for Itachi and Kasami to stay out of range of the sound's regular patrols. As they sat around the fire, eating what would be their last meal together, each was reflecting on the past weeks. For Itachi and Kasami, it had been a unique opportunity not only to teach, but also to spend time with someone who wasn't afraid of them. Everywhere they walked, fear followed, no S-class criminals, not even Rochimaru had the aura of fear carried by Uchiha Itachi and Hoshigaki Kasami. But here was a boy who was not only immune to it, but also impressed by it. In his weeks with Itachi, Naruto had become quite adept with all 35 fear, stimulus, and could now simultaneously use 12 without screwing up. 
both found themselves developing the same kind of relationship with the boy that they had with each other. They didn't necessarily like each other, but they accepted and tolerated each other. And for people like them, that was enough. Itachi looked up from his musings, laughing slightly at his own emotions. He was a man who had slaughtered his own family, and here he was feeling an attachment, however slight, to a boy he had met only weeks before. But then again, he thought as he watched Kasami try to teach the boy to use his new bandage like sword wrappings. How did someone define family? A large part of it was a feeling of belonging, which Itachi had never felt anywhere until he became Kaizam's partner. So had the Uchiha clan really been his family? He was broken out of his thoughts again as Kasami and Naruto wrestled in a pile of tangled cloth. He smiled as he silently watched them. As the last of the fire was dying out, Naruto got ready to leave. He wanted to arrive at the sound at dawn. Kasami just nodded to him as Itachi handed him his bag. It had been a unanimous decision that any of them would deny to their graves what had happened over the last two weeks, so silence seemed appropriate. It would be unlikely that they would ever meet again. Naruto turned and ran out of the camp. Halfway to the sound, he stopped for lunch and found a box of double chocolate pocky in his bag. Naruto carefully approached the gates of the hidden sound. The gates were open and there was a small amount of traffic going in and out. Naruto waited for his turn and line then approached the guard. Who are you and what is your reason for being here? The guard asked in a bored tone. Fushikao Naruto is my name, and I'm here to see a swordsmith about getting this, he gestured to the neatly wrapped Kubaikiri who shaw on his back, fixed up. Naruto spoke without a shred of hesitation, he had practiced his speeches until he knew them backwards and forwards. The guard looked at him curiously. Village of origin? Missed, Naruto replied. Equivalent rank. Shayunin. Time since you left your village? One one half years. The guard appeared satisfied and waved him through. Naruto entered the village with his heart pounding. The last question hadn't been one they'd rehearsed. The next few moments were some of the most anticlimactic of Naruto's life. It didn't sound looked like. Well. A village. He wasn't sure what he had been expecting, but this wasn't it. With the exception of the slightly more rough around the edges look the sound had, it could have been Kanoha. Naruto just wandered around for a few minutes, basking in all that was the village of the hidden sound, but he soon remembered that he had a mission and one that was very dependent on timing. After a few minutes of asking around, he was pointed in the right direction and found himself in front of a house. The nameplate of the door read Kirin, but it didn't look like a shop of any kind. Then he saw smoke coming from the backyard. He jumped over the fence and his face blanched. There was no way this person could be anyone other than Kaizam's brother. There couldn't be many people in the world that looked so shark-like. He appeared to be pounding on a red-hot hunk of metal, but Naruto didn't see any fire. He observed the man for another minute or two, watched him dunk the metal into a bucket of water, and suddenly his hands were forming seals, Naruto watched in interest. Suddenly the man spoke, Gaokakyu no Jutsu. He called as he breathed a flame that engulfed the metal. Naruto nodded to himself. Definitely the right guy. Naruto jumped back over the fence and knocked on it. He heard grumbling for a moment before Kirin opened the gate looking annoyed and glanced down at Naruto and more pointedly at the wrapped sword on his back. What do you want brat? Naruto grinned. He had more in common with his brother than his looks. Naruto tried to sound professional, I have a repair job for you, one probably better discussed in private. Kirin looked at him suspiciously, but let him in and closed the gate. He walked to the back door of the house and opened it, gesturing Naruto to go inside. Once they were comfortably seated in Kirin's rather boring living room, Naruto took the sword off his back and with a flick of his thumb, it had taken hours to master the knot that held the bindings, the cloth fell off. Back in Kanoha, everyone was on edge. With the attack force leaving in six days for the sound, kunais were being nervously sharpened all over the village. The San siblings sat nervously in their assigned room. Shortly after Tsunade's announcement, 
The sand had sent them a message telling them not to bother coming back and that the sand was going to send 170 nins to support the Kanoha attack on the sound. No one missed the irony of this act. The role the three siblings had been given was containment. They were each given a squad of Shayunin, and their task would be to patrol the forest and make sure no one important escaped from the chaos that would be the hidden sound. At this precise moment, Gara was feeling out of place. Not because he was a demon or a murderer, but because he had nothing to polish. Kankuro was carefully wiping down Karasu, and Tamari was buffing her fan with a dry sponge. And all this time, Gara just sat there, doing nothing. Tamari looked at her brother oddly, he had been staring at her hand buffing her fan for about five minutes now. It wasn't helping her nerves. She had been in wars before, but this time she was in charge of a group of Shayunin, and most of them were from the leaf. She knew she had the lazy ass and his team under her command, but hadn't really heard much else. Leadership was a responsibility she wasn't sure she wanted, it was more suited to Gara with his unshakable calm. Tamari spotted a scuff mark and buffed furiously. She supposed all she could hope was that nobody dangerous tried to get past her section of forest. Far away, Kirin was in shock. Kubai Kiri Husha, he whispered as if afraid it would disappear. He reached out to touch it, and after getting an acknowledging nod from Naruto, he picked it up and examined it. Where did you get this? Kirin asked. Naruto had practiced this too, I was part of Zabos's group, and am now the only one left alive. I've started to use the sword myself but needed it repaired. Kirin looked at him carefully, do you know how to handle it? Naruto nodded, I've been practicing since Zabuza died, and I like to think I'm proficient. More importantly, how much for you to fix it? Kirin shook his head, I can't be charged for fixing it, the sword isn't broken, it was just never finished. Naruto's eyes widened as Kirin continued, I was driven out of hidden mist before I could finish it, I had heard it had been given to Zabuza the demon, who had also later fled, but I never dreamed I'd see it again. He looked up at Naruto, I don't want any money, it would be my greatest pleasure to finish the sword, but first I need to see you handle it. Naruto would realize later that showing Kirin routines Kasami had taught him probably wasn't a good idea, but Kirin never noticed. It was imperative to the mission that no one, not even Kirin himself, ever find out Naruto had been working with the Akatsuki, so Naruto knew he'd have to be more careful. Kirin nodded after a few minutes of Naruto showing off, but then caught the boy off guard, okay, so you're good up close, how good is your aim? Naruto blinked. Aim. When you throw it. Kirin looked exasperated. Naruto blinked again. He felt really stupid, after all, the first time he had seen the sword it had been flying in the air over his head. Kirin sighed, the boy had shown he could handle the sword. Okay, new condition, Kirin declared, I will finish the sword, but after you have to learn how to make use of its full potential, otherwise, you're wasting it, and I won't allow that. Naruto nodded, it was better than he had hoped for. He found out that it would take five days of solid work to finish Kubai Kiri Husha, and that, until then, Kirin was to be left alone. This left Naruto with five days of spare time. He had never had that much spare time before. The first thing he did was find a ramen stand and order 12 bowls. But after that, finding himself with nothing else to do, Naruto decided to train. He found a sound training field and joined those already there. He tried practicing Kirigakur no Jutsu once, then switched to Taijutsu when everyone else on the field glared at him and the mist he was making. He threw himself into training for the next five days, fighting to become as strong as he knew he needed to be if he wanted to survive. In Kanoha, Shinobi were doing much the same preparing for a war. On the fifth day, Naruto went back to Kirin's shop, and the man himself walked out holding a cloth-wrapped bundle. In Kanoha, Tsunade strode up to a podium and faced her troops. Though hundreds of miles apart, and in very different tones of voice, the swordsmith and Hokage spoke in almost perfect synchronization. It's time for you to show me what you've got. That's it for this part if you enjoyed it then like, share and subscribe for the next video as it's going to be more interesting, and also check out my other playlists hope you would like them too.